It is my great pleasure to introduce Ricardo Spani. Yeah, Spani? Got it? Close enough. Uh, to speak uh, about TARI, uh, advancing Monero through ecosystem development. <laughs> Hello, everyone. All right, TARI. So, for those that don't know, I'm Ricardo Spagni. You may know me as Fluffy Pony. Uh, if you don't know me, that's okay. Um, I'm the lead maintainer for Monero's core software. Um, I'm also one of the core team, one of the seven people that forked Monero away from Thankful for today. We loved him so much that we took things away from him. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Tari Labs, and uh, that's really what I'm here to talk about a little bit today. I'm going to talk about what Tari is, why, or how we're building Tari, how we're architecting it, and uh, why anyone in this room should even care. So, or anyone watching online. So what is Tari? Let's start with that. So Tari is a digital assets focused protocol that is being architected as a merge mine sidechain with Monero. Okay, that's the TLDR. Now people say, okay, what is a digital asset? So a digital asset um, are things that people can buy or earn, but they exist entirely in digital form. Now there are um, uh, other uh, protocols out there that have done digital assets in the past. The earliest one that uh, you might be familiar with was Colored Coins, um, built on, on Bitcoin, and then later on Counterparty, also built on Bitcoin. In many ways, Tari is kind of like a spiritual sister, spiritual successor um, to Counterparty. Um, we're very in we were very inspired by a lot of the things that Counterparty did, and in fact, one of the earliest things we took a look at was could we port Counterparty to Monero? which was a lot more difficult than we expected, so we scrapped that idea and decided to start from scratch. Um, digital assets, and when we refer to, to digital assets, as we mentioned there, they're natively digital, are things that um, are not physical. They might exist in physical form, um, or might have existed in physical form in the past, but they can exist as a natively digital asset. So think things like in-game assets, in-game tokens, uh, digital collectibles like CryptoKitties, those are all obvious ones. Um, what about things like loyalty points? Um, ICO tokens, sure, uh, security tokens, STOs, uh, tickets, um, live event tickets or cinema tickets or theme park tickets, all of those can exist um, as uh, digital assets. Um, you can also do other cool things, you could do things like DRM tokens, you could do things like licenses for software, all of these things could exist in a decentralized protocol as a digital asset. Now, you know, the, the, the idea is really cool, and of course having a digital assets protocol that is merged mined with, uh, with uh, Monero in and of itself is nice. But we try to eschew the idea of build it and they will come. I don't think that anyone really believes that if you build something cool that people are just going to pitch up and go, oh, that's so cool, we're going to stop the way we've been doing things and start using that. Like, you need to be like 100x better. You need to have a... a um, a protocol, not just a protocol, but an, a, a user experience and a developer experience and an issuer experience that is like 100x better. You need to be like the Airbnb or the Uber of digital assets. And right now, that's not really possible because most digital asset issuers are quite comfortable with whatever they've been using. So we have a, 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 some secret source. Um, we have an unfair advantage. One of those unfair advantages is that we're building an actual business um, that will eventually use Tari. That business is called Big Neon, and it's a ticketing company. Um, and one of my third co-founder, Dan Tari, um, is uh, the guy who started Ticketfly, sold it to Pandora for $450 million, largest, largest exit in ticketing history. So he's a guy with a lot of experience in ticketing. Um, and so he's building this business uh, along with us, and uh, Big Neon currently um, doesn't use Tari because Tari doesn't exist in like production form, but the idea is that it's spinning up, um, it's building up uh, to you know many millions of tickets a year, um, and that that will then switch that actual user base over to using Tari. So that becomes a proof point because now all the other people that will be building on Tari or that we hope will be building on Tari will be able to look at that proof point and say, oh cool, this company uses Tari. And it's a real company with real users, with a big user base, that has really complex digital assets. Because tickets are really complex digital assets. They're generally temporal in nature and short-lived. But if you went to the last Michael Jackson concert, you might want to keep your ticket stub forever. So you can't rely on them being short-lived. They also have complex rules. 
Um, and ticket, ticket issuers want to have more complex rules. Uh, you might go to a, a small venue and maybe that's kind of okay. You just sort of pitch up there and go, hi, I'm Bob, and they look on the list and they go, okay, Bob, and they let you in. But if you go to a larger concert nowadays, they want to see your ID. There have been incidences at concerts that make um, uh, venue owners and, and large venue owners in particular very nervous about who's coming. So there's all these complex rules that they want to build around tickets. Um, and there's, of course, the other forcing function, which is when a hot ticketing on sale happens. So you've got, say, a 10,000 cap venue and Taylor Swift is playing. Then you've got 50 or 100,000 people that are sitting there clicking refresh on a Saturday morning to try and buy tickets. And that sort of pressure on a decentralized protocol, well, it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, planning and a lot of really good architecture. So how are we architecting Monero? Uh, Monero. <laughs> how are we architecting Tari? So the way we're architecting Tari, we thought a lot about this. Um, and the first thing we did is we threw out the idea of a white paper. Because otherwise, it's like, hi, I'm Fluffy Pony. Here's my white paper. Go implement. I mean, that's not a good way to architect anything. Like, I have some cool ideas, but <laughs> I'm certainly not uh, the, the owner of all the cool ideas. So we started off with this idea of, like, let's build the white paper with the community. Um, Tari Labs is an organization that we set up that has uh, some people who work for Tari Labs who are focused on building Tari. So it's a sizable contributor to the protocol, but it's not the only one. Um, and the only real decisions we made is we figured, like, we want a really uh, scalable base protocol. So Mimblewimble is um, a good starting point. Um, and we wanted to build things in Rust. And building things in Rust was also a very um, measured decision. It wasn't something that we suddenly decided, hey, cool, Rust is kind of nice. Let's do that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this thing that we were building would not take any existing Monero contributors away from Monero. Because people can have shiny object syndrome, and you know, if you're a C++ developer working on Monero's code base, which can be clunky at times, you know, now there's this brand new code base which is modular and well-architected and beautiful and actually has comments, you might want to go and work on that new thing. But now if you say to a C++ developer, hey, go learn Rust, they'll go, no, don't worry about it, I'll stick to working on Monero for now. Um, also, it's a side chain. Uh, it's a side chain in the sense that it's merge mined with Monero, and we plan on adding atomic swaps. Um, and the atomic swaps, we've got a bunch of ideas about how to do that. We might have a synthetic asset uh, for Monero that exists on Tari, and then you're able to swap in and out of that and use the DEX to go into um, a, a native Tari uh, token or just transact in the synthetic Monero. The idea behind this is, again, Mimblewimble, fantastic from a scalability perspective, and it even has some really cool privacy properties. And so if people want to use that layer for, I don't know, buying coffee, instead of using base layer Monero for buying coffee, then they should be able to move in and out um, relatively easily and relatively cheaply. Um, and the building blocks of Tari are, again, having actual use cases. Not build it and they will come, not field of dreams, but saying like, who are the actual users? Who are the actual developers and the actual issuers that will want to use Tari and that have already expressed interest in using Tari? Um, and then good design is, of course, a very uh, key element as well, because as you no doubt know, uh, user experience in the blockchain space nowadays, it's not so good. Um, and we plan on improving that. Now, um, we started this process a few months ago of engaging with the community and having these online discussions, and we still do them on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and we have uh, on the, the uh, Tari uh, website, on the blog, there's a bunch of protocol discussions, you know, 40 plus of them, that you can go, if you, if you really have a lot of time, you can go read all of them, um, and you can see how we how we reach certain decisions as a developer community, that it wasn't just um, us going, hey, this is the way we're going to do it, that it, we had a lot of bad ideas that we chucked out and a lot of good ideas that have sat around and uh, been mulled over and discussed over and over again to get to the point where we are today. So where are we today? Well, where we are today is we have a RFC, a set of, uh, of standards for Tari, which is coming together quite nicely. Um, you can go take a look at them on rfc.tari.com, and we have actual code that's being written. So on github.com uh, forward slash tari dash project, there's an actual um, tari thing, which is obviously so sort of like you can go compile it and do anything yet, but there's a bunch of scaffolding and code that's being written. Um, and people are, are uh, more people are getting interested in tari on a daily basis and pitching up and 
having to learn Rust, which is challenging, but uh, you know, as they cut their teeth and they start to play with things, they become more adept as Rust developers and they start to contribute to the project. So the question is, and I think this is really the main point of all of this, why should anyone care? Why, should, why did we even start building Tari? I mean, yeah, digital assets are cool, and, uh, and Mimblewimble's really hip right now, um, and we're going to be the third Mimblewimble implementation. But, you know, is that really a reason to go out and build something? I'd argue it is, but <laughs> there are probably other reasons, right? So why should any of you care? So the thing is, Monero's got a really strong community. It's a grassroots uh, a community that's built up from the grassroots level. Um, at the beginning, in Monero's earliest days, if there were 10 or 15 of us, it was a lot. Um, if there were 10 people in the Monero dev channel, it was a lot. The problem is that may not be enough, that we might be getting to a point where we hit a plateau, and we can't really go much further than that. And the, the issue with that is Monero then becomes a really powerful tool, a really powerful piece of software with niche appeal. And we want Monero to have broader appeal. But in order to have broader appeal, there's all sorts of things that we need to do that we might not be able to if we just rely on the core community as it is right now. Because we're up against others who are really resourceful and well-funded. And I'm not just talking about state-grade attackers um, or you know, people who want to destabilize Monero because they think they're cooler than us or whatever. But I mean, think about projects like EOS that raised $4 billion. And they have this thing called PEOS, PEOS, which is <laughs> private EOS. I mean, if you've got $4 billion and you really wanted to eat Monero's lunch, you'd find a way to do it. You would wreak havoc in Monero's community. You'd have a guy come in, pretend to help. Maybe his name's Fire Ice, I don't know. And then, <laughs> and then just cause a bunch of havoc. And then you'd start shilling your thing on Twitter, and you'd, start to have, you'd have a little army of Twitter shills going and replying to all the threads and saying, oh, PEOS P -E is the future of private transactions. It's cheap and super private and better than Monero. And you'd do all of this. You'd, I mean, you'd be able to buy a user base. That's what we're up against. That's the competition. And then we've got state-grade attackers that are like, well, we don't like Monero, so what, we, what can we do to like make their day difficult. And the CCS, the crowdfunding system, which used to be called the FFS, but we realized that FFS stood for something else, and so we <laughs> renamed it the CCS. The CCS is amazing, but again, the CCS has an upper bound. And that upper bound is people that use the CCS for crowdfunding already have to be interested in Monero. They have to be interested in Monero. They have to come along and say, I'm a developer. I want to work on Monero. There's a bunch of cool things that I already know I can make. This is the time estimates for doing that. It doesn't help you when you want to go out and find someone to do a job. We tried that in the past. We've done that where we've raised funds and said, then we will go out and find a developer. And it's been a mess every single time. Because the, per the developer ultimately is just not, re they don't really have a vested interest. Um, and heaven forbid the price of Monero drops, then they're panicking about whether they're going to get paid at the end of the month. So we're starting to hit this upper bound of how far we can go. And it's very easy for us to say, well, you know, as in the Bitcoin community, they say the honey badger don't care, right? And in Monero, um, we say tardy grade don't care. Um, but the reality is, even if we are the tardy grade of money, like, there's still a limited appeal. There's an upper bound for how big we can grow. And we want to grow bigger. We want to have mass appeal. The reason for that, the big reason, is because all of us care about privacy. And privacy is about getting lost in the crowd. Now, if your crowd has an upper bound, that's deeply problematic. You want to have a crowd of millions and millions of daily active users so that everyone can get lost in it. And that when you know, trying to pick out who's who in the zoo becomes difficult to the point of impossible. So that's why, that's why Tari exists. Now, there's three examples of um, things that Tari is going to help Monero with. Um, over time that Monero would struggle um, achieving on its own. The first is good, user, you, good UX. UX is user experience. Um, now, we have iterated on the, Monero, the core Monero wallet design um, over the years. We've had a lot of really uh, good mobile and uh, uh, mobile apps like My Monero, Cake Wallet, Monorujo, that have also iterated on their design. But ultimately, I think we can all acknowledge that using Monero is kind of clunky. You know, it's not easy. Having 95 character long addresses <laughs> is not easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's objectively worse than using Bitcoin from a user experience. Um, and that's why a lot of people do things like leave their money on exchanges. 
you know, like, cool, I've bought some Monero and I'm just gonna leave it there because I don't even know what a 95 character address is. What's a payment ID? What, what's a sub address? This stuff is confusing to users. Um, educating regulators is also hard. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the, you know, how we plan on doing that in a second. Um, and then the CCS is a leap of faith. So if you pitch up and you're a developer and you wanna use the CCS for full-time employment, you want the CCS to fund you for six months or 12 months or longer, it's a leap of faith. You've got to trust that the community is going to continue to fund you um, in progressive tranches. And I'm sure that the, the two MRL researchers who are here can attest to how hair-raising that can be on a month-by-month -month basis, especially when the Monero price starts to fluctuate. So let's talk about user experience. Now, we have a bunch of really cool tools um, uh, in Monero. Uh, like the command line tool has really fleshed itself out over time. Um, really fantastic uh, power tools, but they are clunky to use. And we believe that, um, that we can do better from a UX perspective, even for power tools. And what I want to do is I just want to walk through a little video, a video clip of a design that we're playing around with um, for Tari, not for Monero. Um, and this is of a, a validator node. So a validator node in Tari is a node you run. You can think of it like dash master node, <coughs> where, where you run it and it sits by itself and you, you lock up some Tari and then you're able to participate in, in digital asset validator pools um, and you're able to do certain validation actions um, and because you act as a validator, you get paid. So this is um, a, uh, what we think um, a validator node manager might look like. Um, and this is of course, you know, totally hypothetical, uh, but this is all designed in conjunction with um, engineering. So it's not just like, you know, a designer thinking that something like this is cool. This is like actual uh, software engineers saying, yes, that's possible. Actual researchers saying, no, we can't do that in a decentralized manner. Yes, we can do that safely, and so on. So this is now, you fire up this little piece of software, you're connecting to the validator node. It might be on your local network. It might be sitting um, as a little droplet on DigitalOcean. It might be on your local network, whatever. Um, so now you've connected to it. Um, you're now going to register the validator node uh, on the Tari network. Um, it's busy doing its little thing. It's going to measure some stats like what is your disk space capacity, what's your internet speed like, how many instructions per second can you handle, um, can, can this machine handle. Um, and now that it knows who you are and what you're capable of and you've got some money locked up, you now want to start managing assets. Uh, and obviously a lot of the stuff like once you get started, you would be able to um, set, some, set some automatic thresholds and then let it run. Or you might go and manually control things and be like, I'd like to try and handle that asset because I think it's going to pay me a lot of money. Or I want to you know, not handle that asset because I don't like Disney or whatever. Um, so here's an asset marketplace. Um, these are marketplaces of, uh, marketplace of assets that need validator nodes. So they don't have an existing uh, validator pool that's full. Um, and so now your uh, validator node is applying to um, try and be part of that validator pool. Um, and some, sometimes it's declined. Some, you know, someone else gets in front of you. Uh, but sometimes it's approved. Um, and you know, some money's locked up each time, depending on it. Um, and now you're able to go and look at it and be like, oh, okay, I'd like to manually filter through assets and add them to uh, add myself to the wait list. Um, and then finally. Uh, we want to see like our active bids um, and see what we're actually participating in and what we're what we're trying to participate in. Um, and then you know we might also want to, at some point, see some stats. You know what are the fees that we've collected? Uh, what are the announcements that some of these assets are making that might be relevant to us? Um, and then what are the assets we're, that we're currently processing? So this is, I think, a, a really slick, really cool user interface and a really good user experience for someone who's doing something that is kind of akin to mining. You know, it's like they want to passively earn money and it's re it requires them to like put a little bit of work into it, a little bit of effort into it. But why does it need to be ugly? Why does it need to be this like gross web interface from like 2006 or like a command line tool that, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna use this, I'm gonna use the command line tool, but why does it only have to be that? We can do more. So. Good UX is hard, and we believe that we can bring 
really good resources to bear that are focused not only on uh, building good user experiences for Tari, but building good user experiences for Monero as well. And something that you can think of as an example of how this might play out, besides just the obvious, which is you know directing um, resources towards actually building a good UX for Monero, is something that, that, uh, that could play out is we go, hey, here's a good UX pattern that we're going to use for the Tari wallet. That UX pattern is open source. We then go to my Monero, Monerujo, and Cake wallet, and we say, what do you guys think of this open source UX pattern? And they go, hey, that's really cool. And now, you know, overnight, like literally all the mobile wallets are transformed and they have a better UX pattern, whether it is in the way you send funds or the way you acknowledge receipt or whatever it is. And it makes a big difference. And, and that, I think, is really, really powerful. Educating regulators as well, super hard to do. Um, and we're trying to bring as many resources as we can to bear, as many connections as we can to bear. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we're working with a number of people in the community, a number of businesses who benefit from Monero's existence. Um, and we're working with a large, well-known law firm, who I'm not going to name just yet, to produce a set of open source guidelines for exchanges to list Monero. Because as you no doubt know, exchanges, some exchanges have expressed a little bit of hesitation with uh, listing Monero. I don't know why, it's so weird. Um, and we think that with this open source set of guidelines, um, which have been put together by you know, a well-known law firm and a bunch of really clever attorneys, that we'll be able to satisfy the concerns and questions that, um, that exchanges might have. And they'll be able to take those guidelines and, say, and look at them and be like, cool, that's how we can list Monero without being concerned about regulatory overreach. And then, of course, the CCS being a leap of faith um, is another concern. And the way we want to challenge that, the way we want to um, improve that, is we want to put together um, what is effectively uh, a, a sort of dev fund, um, not just for Tari, but also for Monero. So someone can pitch up and they can say, well, I want to build this cool thing on Monero. I don't want to use the CCS. I just want to have like fixed income every month, and I want to know that for the next 12 months I've got income. And then there will be like a grant process, like a grant process at a university. You'll have to go through that grant process. There'll be an open work group of uh, Monero and Tari contributors who will ultimately make the call as to whether the grant um, is, is applicable or not. I mean, this is all work in progress. We don't have you know, exactly how it would work um, finalized. But effectively, what would happen is if you get that grant, you would then be able to work on, on the thing that you want to build for Monero over the next 6 or 12 or 24 months, knowing that you've got income coming in every, uh, at the end of every month. And then we want to take that to the next level in future um, and build physical dev centers, which, you know, like, if, again, if you wanted to build something on Monero, even an ecosystem component, you could pitch up, you could apply for a grant, and you could physically have a desk at a dev center um, you know, near you, and you could go there and work on that thing every day, knowing that you've got resources you can tap into, you're working alongside cool people that share your vision and your ideas, and uh, that you're getting paid at the end of the month, which is you know, necessary to like, eat and live. Um, and so, sort of in closing, what I wanted to talk about is just the current efforts that uh, Tari has made to provide radical support for Monero. Um, so Monero's success is at Tari's core, and we talk about that to everyone, whether it's venture capitalists um, or other companies that we engage with in the space, or even regulators. We talk about how important Monero is. We also currently cover the great firewall-busting CDN that Monero uses. So you may not know this, but we have a CDN with uh, 16... 19 spots um, in China. So when someone in China tries to download the Monero software um, or uh, even download the, the raw blockchain bootstrap, they're doing so from a local point inside China behind the Great Firewall. And so even if the Great Firewall tried to block them, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, and we think that's a pretty big deal. It's super expensive. <laughs> it used to be covered, uh, we try to cover it with donations. That we struggled with that. We didn't want to do a CCS fundraise for it because Tari offered to, to cover it, so that's great. Um, Tari also covers the costs for the biannual uh, Monero Research Lab research workshops, and it's got a dedicated fund for funding CCS proposals. So when new CCS proposals come up, um, then someone takes a look at them and says, cool, I think that we should contribute X amount of Monero to it, um, and we try and get things kick-started as well with that. So that's what we're currently doing. That's what we want to do. Um, and ultimately, we think that Tari is going to be good for the, the Monero ecosystem, and it's going to be something cool that people will be able to build on and will be able to use. 
And that's all I have to say today. Great, I answered all of them. <laughs> so you're talking about creating a, a, a place to, for, to manage digital assets. And I noticed that you're not just talking about non-fungible tokens or cryptocurrencies, but things like NFL and Disney. So are we talking about traditional equities and other markets that could be integrated into the platform? And if that's the case, what do the conversations look like right now with these quote unquote traditional companies that have assets that might become digital in the future? Cool, so a lot of the, the thinking, I mean the NFL and Disney stuff is a little bit tongue in cheek because we imagined a world where a Star Wars Disney game, um, or Star Wars computer game rather, or console game, might have a digital asset that you could purchase. You know, So you're playing the game, you wanna purchase this thing that you know gives you a power up or whatever, and you could do so through a digital asset um, that is decentralized that if you stop playing the game, you could take and you could sell. And then you could use that money to buy an asset in another game. Or if you are playing the game on and off and your friend wants to lend that digital asset from you, or someone wants to lend it, you could charge them a lending fee for that asset. And then you obviously can't use it in the game at the same time, but they could, and when you know they're done, then they can give it back to you and they stop paying the lending fee. Um, so that was sort of the world that we're envisioning. Same with like NFL, you can imagine that uh, digital collectible cards, um, baseball cards and uh, football cards and that sort of thing um, could exist in a, a digital form. Um, and there's lots of cool things that you can do with that. Um, and absolutely, from a, an equity perspective, uh, we think that STOs uh, could be a very, a very powerful vehicle um, towards uh, either raising money or just taking existing stock options and saying we're going to give you an STO, a token instead of a share certificate. Um, and that, I think, is a really cool future. From a regulatory perspective, STOs are kind of murky right now. Um, there's some places where they're less murky than others, um, and there are countries that are trying to rapidly pass um, laws that are very applicable to STOs. So I think we're almost at a point where we're gonna come out of that murky um, regulatory space where companies will be able to say, I'm not gonna issue stock, I'm gonna issue a security token. Um, and then the, the whole idea is to have, make sure that Tari is also architected for that world, where a company has the tools to be able to do that and automatically file whatever paperwork they need to file through you know, one click. So that, that's the world that we're trying to envision as well. So uh, thanks for your talk. I noticed that you said that things are being built in Rust and I've heard some people, uh, like one or two people have actually come up to me already to ask about this. I noticed some people are already starting to think about rebuilding things in Rust and rebuilding the light wallet server in Rust or, you know, so, uh, sort of a two-part question. How do you foresee the Monero project code base switch from C++ to Rust happening, if at all? And how should people split their time across C++ and Rust at this point? So, excuse me. So I think, um, and I was asked this question yesterday, I think that it is possible to, to um, rewrite Monero and Rust and to have a clean transition from one to the other, but it would require a bunch of stuff. You'd ultimately have to have something like a, um, a library that's part of the existing implementation that's able to validate transactions and blocks. Um, and then you can rewrite everything else and just pull that library into the Rust implementation until such time as you're ready to cut over. But you kind of need to have a hard fork to cut over. It's very difficult to run two implementations in parallel and just hope and pray that they're not gonna stumble over you know, an edge case and then half your network falls apart. Um, so because of the consensus critical nature, it would be a very big project. It would also probably piss Monero Moo off, so I don't know, I don't know how, <laughs> he's how much we want to go there. <laughs> yeah, he's not a, not a, not a big fan of Rust. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging, you know, I mean, it's definitely something that, we, that, that I think there are people who are interested in doing um, that would want to do, but I think it's something that's several years away at least, um, just because of the, the sheer amount of effort involved. To speak to your second question, how should people split their time? Well, if you are a developer who wants to learn Rust, um, then there's a lot of stuff that you can dabble in. There are lots of little starter projects online. Um, and Big Neon, the ticketing company that we started, we built an entire ticketing software stack and continue to work on it um, that is written in Rust. So you're welcome to pitch up and work on that as well. Um, it's called Ticket Node. 
uh, currently lives on the Big Neon uh, repository. We're moving it over to a repository of its own. Um, and the idea is, if you want to learn Rust, that's a piece of software that's not consensus critical, where you can go and learn how to build um, scalable and secure and robust software in Rust. Great. Um, I would really love to have more questions, but in order to keep this longer session going, uh, we're going to cut it right now. But if you guys have more questions for Ricardo, please uh, find him in the crowd. Um, once Thank again, you. everybody, please give Rick a great hand.